turn in advance to Daniel chapter 9. I had to actually do my due diligence over the past several weeks. We had four parts or four Ps, and I'll break them down in a moment. I had to go back, and what I hate doing is listening to myself. But I had to do it because I was like, where have we been? I need to get caught up on what I shared over the past month in Daniel 9. So I took my time, and I listened to myself, and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that. Oh, do I sound like that? Are these people lying to me at the door when they're leaving and saying, good message, Pastor Matt? I need to do a message on honesty around here. But let's pray real quick, and then we're going to dive heart first into the Word of God. Father, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, your Son, our Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords, I pray your Holy Spirit would illuminate, fall upon the hearts and the ears in this room and give us clarity from heaven, wisdom, discernment. Father, use me to speak truth. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. So over the past two weeks, I went from Colorado to New York, two separate camps, both which were using me to share messages. So I spoke 10 sermons in 12 days. So not much rest, but interestingly, as I look back at those two weeks and the time allotted, I was handed an itinerary on both trips. When I touched down and I met the camp coordinator, they handed me an itinerary. And on the itinerary was each day's details from where I was supposed to be, when I was supposed to be there, what would happen when I got there. Some of the events during the week didn't involve me, but I still knew what was happening at any given time, on any given day. I knew the details. I knew what to expect. That was my itinerary for those two weeks. And when I thought about that, it was remarkable to come to the conclusion that that's exactly what God's word is. With three Ps, first and foremost, prophetically, God's word is an itinerary. That is why you must know the book. You must understand the good book. In the book is an itinerary, prophetically speaking, of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, sometimes who it's going to happen through or by, and you need to know that itinerary so that you can be prepared. Now, that's what leads me to the next P. Prophetically, I'm aware of that. One-third of this book is prophetic in nature, which means God said it before it happened, and with precision and accuracy, he's never missed And if he's fulfilled every prophecy from the Old Testament bleeding into the New Testament, with many still unfulfilled, I go, if he didn't fail then, he's not going to fail now. So I watch and I wait with diligence. Practically, it's also my itinerary as a Christian who needs to know where to be, when to be there, how to be there, and what to do while there to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. I know this when I spend time in the itinerary of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. I literally can see what the Lord has for me each day. It's my agenda. It sets my course. It gives me the peace I need to navigate a world of chaos. And yes, church, the word of God is an itinerary politically. Don't mention that word in church. No, no, seriously, we covered Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, which are roadmaps, roadmaps of a political power in place from Babylon all the way to the end of age. Did you know that? These dreams and visions that were given, one through a king named Nebuchadnezzar, two through Daniel himself, both which show us a roadmap, politically speaking, of world powers that would rule the world, would be adversarial towards Israel, Now, you got to understand, the most formidable foe that has been used by the enemy to oppose the church of Jesus Christ has been through the government. Okay, so we should take interest in what's happening governmentally, globally, in our own country. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, all of which shows us from Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire, to the Grecian Empire, to the Roman Empire, to a projected, revived Roman Empire with the end day scenario. This is what Pastor Matt is laboring to communicate to us on Sundays in the book of Revelation. But there's this gap time. We call it the the age of grace. We call it the church age. We call it the times of the Gentiles. We're in that time right now. And what I want to say to you based on Daniel chapter 9 is if we're in that time right now and God has you alive for such a time as this, how are you living for his glory, by his grace, 
And what are you using your gift to contribute back to the body? How are you using what God has given you to edify the body of Christ? Because if you use your gift and you let God use you where he's placed you, one, you will be living in fulfillment of what God has created you to do. And you'll know it. Two, you will experience opposition. You will be opposed. I know you don't like that one, church. I don't like that one either, but the word of God promises it. Yes, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said, if they hate you, know that they hated me before they hated you. If you were like them, if you were of them, they would love you as their own. But I've called you out of the world system. I've set you apart. You are my ecclesia. You are my church. You are my called out ones. I've set you apart. In theology, we say sanctified. Sanctification is God setting you apart to work in you so he can work through you. So I want God to work in me so that his work can be seen through me. But when you stand in obedience to God, you can expect for the enemy to stand in opposition to you. Does that deter you? Does that discourage you? In fact, when I start to feel pressure, when I start to feel opposition, I know I'm going in the right direction. So like Jesus, my face is set like a flint towards my God and the mission that he has me on personally to share his truth, to not compromise his word. And like we went through Daniel chapter 3, regardless of the world around me and the masses and the political correctness and the majority consensus, while everybody is bowing, I want to be standing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know them. When the music began to play, everyone was to bow to a golden image. Can you imagine the scene? A sea of people would have been easy to hide in the midst of so many people. Yet these three young boys, teenagers, in spite of the peer pressure, they were willing to take their stand. And I'm saying that this assembly, in spite of the music of the media, the Marxist mainstream media, when everybody's bowing to it, in spite of the music of the mandates, in spite of the music of the majority, in spite of the music of medical manipulation, are you unwilling to bow down and stand for truth? Daniel did it in chapter 6, did he not? When, When the day is coming, and this is with foresight, right? And my foresight is built upon spiritual insight, which is in alignment with God's sight, So with foresight built upon spiritual insight, which is in alignment with God's sight, I see a day coming where there will be more mandates, there will be more shutdowns, the church will be called non-essential again, and they will tell you you cannot gather. But church, if that's coming, because ultimately, again, knowing my itinerary, the world's moving in a certain direction. I don't know if you know that. And the Bible tells me exactly where it's going to land. It's going to land Christless. So every structure and every system is in opposition against the one true God. And the church of Jesus Christ is the only light and the only hope that is left. And when he decides to pull back the curtain and the church is raptured, and I'll talk about that next week most likely, what's going to be left? So Daniel here in chapter 6 says we see him in a lion's den because he was told he wasn't allowed to pray. And when you're told you're not allowed to gather, when you're told, or I'm a minister, and you're told you're not allowed to speak truth because that truth you're speaking is hateful. On that day, when you're told you cannot identify as a Christian, what are you going to do? Because it's coming. I could see it. How are you going to respond? Daniel, a faithful servant of the Most High God, a prophet as we know him in Daniel 9, He is at the edge or at the end of this captivity. How did he discover that? He was reading the book. He was reading the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah said that after 70 years, the Lord would release the captives and put them back in their land. Their land was Jerusalem, essentially. Israel, Judah. Judah. And and interestingly, Daniel doesn't kick back. He doesn't pack his bags. He sees that 70 years are almost up. It's about 67 years into captivity, and he engages God by praying. 
And I find it fascinating that many Christians today will use the mantra of God's will be done as an excuse not to do God's will. Well, God's going to have his way anyway, right, minister? Right, pastor? So shouldn't we just kind of sit on the sidelines of life and let the world have at it? And I'm going, no, because if you are a true believer, like salt, you are to be in the position to delay the decay of the day until God calls you out of the way. That's it. And while I'm here, I'm going to be in the way. Daniel engages in a prayer, not to get something from God, but to get in on something with his God. And he uses the word of God which helps generate this prayer to God, which was my first point. Prayer is generated by the word of God. You, not, you need to know the word of God in order to have an enhanced and advanced prayer life. Right? I'm heard in heaven, not from the usage of my own words. I'm heard in heaven by using God's word. See, there's no word that can prevail with God like his own word. In fact, God cannot deny the word he has supplied. If God has given us his word and we claim the promises we just sang about them, God can't deny the word that we have provided back to him. So you gotta, you gotta know the word, right? Jesus said it like this, kind of taking an asterisk from Jesse's message last week. John 15, seven, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, now, don't miss that, because that's not just a free um, ticket to ask for anything you want. It's not a cosmic Coke machine, as Pastor Matt says. This is having God's word inside of you. Look, if you're in me, and I'm in you, if you're in my word, and my word's in you, then you'll ask out of that word, and what you ask from my word will be given to you. That's how that is translated. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in me, Right? And I will give you what? Who knows the word? The desires of your heart. Now, now, think about that. If I delight in Christ, if I spend time with him, if I fall in love with him, if I am in him, his word's going to be in me. And the desires that I came with him are going to actually become his desires. And then his desires placed in my heart are what I'm asking him to do. And one of the things in prison, guys would say to me, oh, Matt, you're a man of the book. You believe God answers prayer? Then, then pray to God to get you out. And I'll go, I don't want to get out because that might be my will, and I don't want my will. My will got me here, so I don't want my will even to get me out of here premature. I want God's will, and if God's will doesn't want me out of here, I'm good with where God's will has me. So Daniel prepares his heart, the first P, and then he moves into praise in this prayer, and the praise was declaring who God is. And, and he, like, he attempts to exhaust the names of God. He uses Elohim, and he uses Adonai, and he uses Yahweh, and, and he uses Jehovah. And then he says, God, you're a mercy giver, and you're a promise keeper, and you forgive, and we're wrong, you're right. And like he just goes in on who God is before he asks for a single thing. It's remarkable. And then he moves into the penance part of the prayer, which is a majority of the prayer, we covered that. He owned his sin. He owned his people's sin. He made no excuses. He was asking God to forgive them for their sin, their iniquity, their trespasses, their transgression. And he literally rings out his confession. He says the same thing that God already knew about their condition. We're sinners. We're sorry. And, and this is the heart of repentance. Not making excuses, not justifying it, actually owning our sinful condition. And then that is the greatest position that God sees and he works in, brokenness. Daniel then goes from penance to the petition. He finally asks God to do something. What does he ask God to do? Restore. In a word, restore your people. Restore your land. Now watch this in verse 20. Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Right now, while I'm speaking, while I'm praying, while I'm confessing, and then it tells us he's presenting supplication before God for a location. Because that's what the holy mountain of God was. It was a location. It was Jerusalem. It was known as a mountainous region. It had many names. It was known as Mount Moriah. It was known as Mount Zion. It was known as the holy mountain of God. It was known as the holy hill of Zion. And all these names that were used to describe 
this place, geographically speaking, some call it the center of the world. It's the place where God will eventually establish his throne. It's the place where he allowed a line of kings to sit upon a throne, almost as his reflection and his representation. We know how that went, many of which departed. David, however, one of the kings of Israel, the great King David, used as a picture the son of David, which would be Jesus, who would eventually come and sit upon that throne. But I couldn't get past this mountain of my God. I did my research, and it took me on my journey. It was fascinating. The first place I landed with what is this holy mountain of God, it was a place called Mount Moriah, and it was a character in the Bible named Abraham. And in Genesis 22, Abraham was told to go into the land of Moriah, but bring your son. And God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, his one and only son. So Abraham takes his son Isaac. They take wood. They take fire. He takes a knife. And Isaac, realizing there's no sacrifice, he asks dad, where's the lamb? And I love it because Abraham doesn't even know in his answer, he's given a foreshadow of a prophecy that the son of God will fulfill by saying, God will provide himself the lamb. Now what happens is God interrupts and intercepts and provides a a ram, not a lamb, and that is what's sacrificed. And this is what Abraham says. You ready? Verse 14, Genesis 22. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Again, God provided an atonement sacrifice then, Abraham not knowing the significance that God would one day on that same mountain provide the atoning sacrifice of his son. The Lord will provide is why we say God is Jehovah, who knows it, Jireh. It's one of his names. But when Abraham said it, he was talking about a place. Okay, 1,000 years later, almost 1,000 years later, you know what happened? The temple is constructed on that exact piece of ground. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So David purchases this location. And eventually, he hands it off like a baton to Solomon, who is allowed to build a temple so that God's presence could be with his people. Because before the temple, it was a tent. And God tabernacled with his people. So you got Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac and this foreshadow of a sacrifice that would take place on that same location with God the Father and God the Son. Now you got David allowing Solomon to build a temple so God's presence could be with his people in that same location. And then a thousand years later again, fast forward a thousand years, and you've entered into the time of Jesus. And on John 19, verse 17, it says this, And Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha. In English, we say Calvary. Golgotha means the place of a skull. Okay, so a thousand years have passed since the construction of the temple where the sacrificial system was instituted, and then Jesus comes along. They hang into a cross, a tree, in the place of a skull, in Golgotha. Golgotha. All right, let me go backwards before I go forward. Because there was something of great significance that took place with the man named David when he was just a shepherd boy. And he stood before a giant named Goliath. Goliath of Gath. Golgotha. Goliath of Gath, Gol, Gath. What do you mean? Where are you going with this, pastor? Did you ever wonder when David chopped off Goliath's head what he did with it? it? Tells us in our itinerary, 1 Samuel 17, verse 54. And David took the head of Goliath and brought it to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Before it was the capital. What did he do with it? Many Bible scholars believe he buried it in a mountain. And they started to call that mountain, which had Goliath's skull buried in it, Golgotha, which fulfilled the prophecy 
when Jesus hung on the cross of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God said to the serpent that her seed, which is Jesus, is going to eventually crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. Where was Jesus' heel bruised? On Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where Goliath's head was decapitated and brought there. It's simply remarkable. This location is of great significance, and da Daniel had no idea what he was even praying for. He was simply saying, restore our city, restore our temple. And God was like, I have so much greater in store. You have no idea. He does greater than we can think, ask, or imagine. Let me put this together. God provided his son as the lamb to die for us. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. The temple to be with us. The actual presence of God in Christ. This sacrifice served to behead the Goliath of death. Death no more has a sting. Making a way for us to behold the triumph of life. Did you know that? That's what Christ did on Calvary. That's what Christ accomplished on the cross. That's why, as Pastor Matt said, in the very beginning of the service, the veil torn. It tells us when Jesus yielded up his ghost, Mark chapter 15, verse 38 says, the veil of the temple tore from top to bottom. The veil is what separated sinful humanity, sinful man, from holy God. It was the holy of holies that was a compartment that only the high priest could enter in one day a year. And when Christ died, that veil completely torn. What did it signify? The floodgates being opened for sinful man to be able to come to a holy God through the one mediator man named Jesus Christ. And that is why in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23, it says this. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. For he who promised is faithful even when I'm faithless. For he who promised is graceful even when I'm graceless. I was in the middle of a message in Colorado. About 100 plus campers, and I hear this little squeaky voice. Off to the side was a door that went out to a deck. My wife would often come and sit on the deck out of view of the campers and of me teaching. But I knew she was out there and she would have my two children. And my little two-year-old daughter heard her daddy's voice. And she did not care what was going on in that room. She had no thought in her mind that she was interrupting anything daddy was doing. In fact, she ran through the side door and she said, Daddy, Daddy. She came up to me, and what did I do? Did I stop her and say, no, honey, I'm in the middle of something. Daddy's busy. No, no, no. I swooped her up in my arms and just held her. And that is exactly what the Bible says you have access to. <laughs> See, in her little innocent and pure mind, think about that. In her little innocent and pure mind, she had no regard that there was other things happening all she heard was her father's voice, and she wanted to be where her father was. And I'm saying that's exactly what prayer should be for the believer. I just want to be where you are, God. I want to be where your voice is. Verse 21, now while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Okay, Gabriel, where did we see this name and this angelic being before? We saw him in chapter 8. Chapter 8, keep in mind, was 13 years earlier at this point. So 13 years earlier, Gabriel was dispatched to help Daniel understand a vision. That vision was in regards to Israel's history and certain kings one man who is a type of Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes, who would unleash hell on the Jews, and we get to see it as a mirror of what's going to happen in the end time scenario. Gabriel is God's public relations messenger. Gabriel shows up in the New Testament. Who's he giving a message to? Zechariah. You're going to have a son. It's going to be John the Baptist. He's going to be the forerunner of the eventual Messiah. Gabriel shows up to a young girl named Mary. He says, you're going to have a baby impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and you're to name him Yeshua, 
Jesus, and he's going to save his people from their sins. Gabriel shows us in the scriptures when God wants to send a very significant message, he's the angel dispatched. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what it says at the end of this verse. Did you catch it? Gabriel arrived at a certain time. Think about this. Daniel is documenting this, and he says, he reached me about the time of the evening offering. Now, you might skim past that as you read it in the Bible. The temple had been destroyed for over 60 years. Sacrifices had ceased upon the temple being desolate. There'd be no reason for Daniel to still be calculating time based on a temple system. Unless, unless he knows he's in Babylon, but his heart is still in Jerusalem. In case you don't know what that means, Jerusalem is always a picture in the scriptures of heaven. You can be in this world and have your heart and your mind cast into another world. And this other world is what gives you peace in the midst of chaos. Daniel is recognizing that he's living in a Babylonian world, Medo-Persian government, yet he's still operating on Jewish time. It's remarkable. What time is it? The evening sacrifice was the ninth hour of the day. Translation, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. was the exact hour when Jesus said, it is finished, and yielded up his ghost. Again, all of the details in the Bible are simply remarkable. They tell a story greater than itself pointing to Jesus, the Son of God. I want to be like Daniel. I want to be living in this world, yet having my heart revolve around the God of the Word. When people ask me any verses that they can read or meditate upon when they're going through it, I always send them one verse. I send them multiple verses, but one verse is my go-to verse. It's the verse that stabilized my heart and mind when I was going through trying times. It's Isaiah 26, verse 3. I would encourage you to memorize it. It says this, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind stays on you because he trusts you. In, in translation, God keeps the individual in shalom, shalom. That's what the Hebrew meant. In perfect peace meant shalom and the Hebrew writer to express how potent this peace was. He just wrote it again, peace. It's a double peace. God will keep you in peace when your mind stays upon his economy. When your mind is set on him, his peace is set on you. Think about it. Some of you are going through some stuff right now. And it's easy to get caught up and preoccupied in the things that are happening to you right now in your life. The stressors. Some of you potentially could lose your job because of certain things be enforced. Some of you are considering not going back to school because of certain things being forced. Some are going through marital conflict. Some going through conflict with their children. I mean, all of us, this room is filled with trouble. But if I focus on the trouble and I let the trouble get inside of my soul, it of course weighs me down and it clogs my ears. And I can't hear God speak when my ears are filled with the wax of the world. So I, at times, need to cast my mind back to the place where God has it all figured out. Where the sovereign God you serve says, I have it all figured out. Stop worrying about it. Be not anxious for anything. Pray about everything. Let your requests be made known to me, God says. So God hears my requests, and then with open hands, I let him imprison me by his peace. Because those who... Behold heaven will be held by heaven. You want heaven to hold you? When's the last time you beheld heaven? When's the last time that heaven and its king were your utmost priority? See, it's impossible to set your mind on things above and not have the king above settle your mind. Should I say that again? It is impossible to set your mind on things above, and not have the king above settle your mind and give you rest. In 2014, a woman named Miriam Ibrahim heard this story recently from a sermon by Tony Perkins, so I'm kind of stealing it from him, but it really fit this part of the sermon. And Miriam was incarcerated or detained by the Sudanese government. Do you want to know her crime at the time? 
for being a Christian, two charges came at her. One, apostasy, because she left the Muslim faith. Two, adultery, not because she cheated on a husband. She married a Christian man. So they charged her with apostasy, which was punishable by, ready, death, hanging, specifically. And they charged her with adultery, which was punishable by 100 lashes. Oh, but that's not all the story. At the time, she had an 18-month-old son. And according to their law, when a parent would get detained, the children go with them. So she's in a dark cell with an 18-month-old son. Oh, but that's not the end of the story. She's also eight months pregnant. And their way of being gracious to the mom is to allow her to give birth in the cell, chained to the bed. She gave birth to a daughter named Maya, all of which incarcerated for her faith. And every single day they'd come to her and they would open the gate and say, you're free to go if you renounce your faith. And every single time she held true to her conviction and her love for Jesus Christ. They came to her and said, your kids can go free. What type of mom would you be for putting your children in such harm? If you renounce your faith, it will all be sorted out. Now, what would you do? Because I know how my mind can justify and go, you know what, you're right. What good is it for them not to have a mom? I'll just renounce my faith publicly, and God will know that I don't really mean it privately. And a lot of people can make those type of justifications. But they asked her, by God's grace alone, somebody intercepted. The church was praying for her because it became an internationally known case. She was eventually released the first time in Sudanese history where they released one of their prisoners who did not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. She was eventually taken to the United States of America where she is a a missionary, in essence, that talks about activism and talks about reform, especially in her own home land. But considering where she was and the loyalty that she placed on her faith when asked, how did you get through what you went through? You know what she said? My faith is life. And when Jesus died on the cross, for me, how could I not defend my faith for him? I mean, do we, do we in America have that type of faith? If we're being honest, would we be willing to put our lives on the line knowing that other things attached to us can be affected for our faith in Jesus Christ? I know the early church did. I know how to read scripture. I know when Paul said, for me to live, but to die is Christ, I knew what he meant by that. He meant the life that I've been given, I'm going to live it for his glory. And even if he decides to call me home, my death will be profitable. What can you do with a man or a woman who has such faith and loyalty and allegiance to a most high God? What enemy could possibly detain or stop The man or woman who truly believes in a holy, living, sovereign, faithful God. What can happen? What would happen in our land if true believers began to rise up and begin to roar, unmoved by any cultural, popular opinion, and we said, we're going to hold this line, and we are going to trust that heaven's going to hold us. What did Gabriel say to Daniel? In verse 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Okay, this is pretty cool. Daniel's praying. He's interrupted by an actual angel. The angel has come forth, dispatched by God himself to give Daniel clarity, understanding. The word is insight. Now, you might say, I want my prayers to come with an angel. And I would say, Your prayer's not going to come with an angel, but every one of your prayers comes with an answer. Did you know that? Every prayer you pray falls into three categories. God will say yes, God will say no, or sometimes God will say wait, and you have to have the discernment to know the difference. And sometimes you're praying, and I say to you, keep praying like Jesse said earlier. Keep persisting in prayer, and know that delays are not denials. You keep praying, and what will happen is that request If it means something to you and you want God's best for your life, then that request, if it is not of God, the more you seek his heart, the more you begin to take away his heart from your prayer time 
and it goes in your heart. So the request might change over time. Immature prayers want to always get out of trouble. Get me out. But the more you seek God and the more you see God is changing you through that trouble, I guarantee you at the end of that trial, you're not saying get me out. You're saying, God, your will be done. I've heard it said best like this. When the request is wrong, God says no. When the timing is wrong, God says slow. When you are wrong, God says grow. But when the request is right, the timing's right, and you are right, God says go. And to all those categories, I say, let it be so. Whether no, whether slow, whether grow, whether go, let it be so. That is what amen means. When you tag amen on the end of a prayer, it means so be it. You're simply giving God permission to have his will be done. Whether you realize it or not, amen, so be it. What you decide for me, I know is best. And that is why I can confidently say what John wrote in 1 John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Which means the answer to every prayer is God's will be done. And how that landed on you is an actual indication of where your faith is with God. Because some of you don't even like that type of answer. Those of you who are mature in your faith, you're going, yeah, you're right. I'm praying for all these things, but God's will be done. See, if I believe his will is best, then I can trust he's going to answer my every request. 1 John 5 15, one verse later, and we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So the, the goal is to get my heart and my prayers and my petitions like Daniel in alignment with God's heart and God's will. Look back at me at verse 22 if you're looking at it. Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. It's the word insight. I've come to give you insight. I've not come to confuse you. Bible prophecy can be very confusing, but that was not the intention of Gabriel's message. Gabriel's message was given to give clarity. And what Daniel had no clue was coming, he's asking about the restoration of his people and his land. And God is sending a messenger to tell him that he's going to restore all of humanity by the sacrifice of his son. But before we get into that, can you just place yourself in Daniel's situation? It's 67 years into captivity. What did he witness the day the Babylonians came through Judea? What, did, what happened? What did those soldiers do? When they went through the temple, when they grabbed families and children and, and moms and what did that look like? Do you think Daniel saw it? He had to have. He was part of the captivity. He was brought into exile. He had to have experienced some type of horror. What did he witness the very night that the Medo-Persian Empire came into the Babylonian Empire and overthrew it? I mean, we read those verses, but we don't give it any color commentary or any graphic imagery in our mind. Why? We should. So for 67 years, Daniel not only is remaining faithful to his God, not only used in a foreign land, not only we see in chapter 9 still praying for his people, but God sends him a messenger. I guarantee you something that began to change in Daniel's spiritual vision. What do you mean? Because it looked one way from the physical eyesight. It always does. And for us, what you're looking at right now if you're only looking at the world through the lens of your smartphone, your iPhone, it's going to look a certain way. It's going to be devastating. I just said that to somebody earlier. I was scrolling through Facebook, and I was like, this world is jacked up. This world is messed up. It's not getting any better. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. The Bible says it's going to go from worse to worse. It says evil men will get worse and worse. Deception will get thicker and thicker. That's what the Bible says. That's my itinerary. I know what, when, how, where, and I'm watching it. But if I'm only seeing it from my physical eyesight, no doubt I'm going to be deceived, manipulated, confused, disoriented. So what is Daniel seeing? Well, he sees a, 
a city of his that he loves, that he's praying about, no doubt in desolation, in destruction. He sees that with his physical eyesight. What do you see with yours? Because it may look a certain way from our eyesight, but I guarantee you this. When you start seeking God's heart, he gives you spiritual insight. And I need spiritual insight, which is new sight, which provides me with fresh might or a new might. Because i got to keep enduring. i got to stop looking at the world through the window of the media or through my iPhone. i got to look at the world through the window of God's word. And I'll say it very quickly, and I'm going to say it in regards to having spiritual insight for such a time as this. Anything that is requiring global compliance should make every Christian spiritually curious. Need I say more? Anything that requires global compliance, all these structures, agencies, organizations, all these figureheads, all these politicians, all uniting on one common ground, one common cause, it should make every Christian who loves the Bible to step back and say, something's not right. I see physical eyesight. It sounds like it's for my physical health, for public health. It sounds like they really care about me. But if they don't have a biblical worldview, you honestly think they have your best interest at their heart? You need to wake up! Amen. Does not take much to see that there is a certain agenda that is currently at work. Does not take much to see that anything that is fast, free, and forced It's probably not the best decision. Daniel says in chapter 9 of verse 23, Gabriel's continuing this clarity for him. He says, at the beginning of your supplication, right? So Daniel, we've heard you the moment you began to petition. The command went out from God. And I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the division. All right, this term, greatly beloved, means you are greatly cherished. You are greatly valued from God. This is what Gabriel said to Daniel. And it's said similarly to the Apostle John. Did you know that? The Apostle John in the New Testament, it's actually said of him, even though he wrote it. I know he wrote it, but if it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote it in John 13, 23. He said that he was laying on the bosom of Jesus, and he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> How do you like that? He wrote that about himself. But there's truth in it because if you look at the Old Testament and Daniel and his book, and you look at the New Testament and John and his book, both were downloaded great revelation. Both were called by God beloved, which tells me something. They must have had hearts. They didn't want anything from God. Their hearts just wanted to be with God. And God goes, I could trust the heart that just wants to be with me, doesn't want to get things from me, to download vision and and revelation that we get to experience as we look at Daniel, which is considered the backbone of Bible prophecy or the key that unlocks revelation. It's remarkable that it came through Daniel and it came through John. Now Daniel is considering, as he's praying, stay with me, the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, he read the number 70. 70 years were set for the, for the Israelites to be in captivity. Why 70 years? Here's a very quick review. They neglected the Sabbath year for 490 years. For 490 years, every seventh year was supposed to be given to rest. But they didn't rest. They kept working the land. So over 490 years, God said, you owe me every seven years. 490 divided by seven you owe me 70 years. So I'm going to take you out of the land, literally, physically, so the land can rest and place them in Babylon. But that wasn't the only reason. They also were an idolatrous people. They had replaced the one true God and they went astray and worshiped other gods. So God said, I'm going to put you in the birthplace of idolatry in Babylon. But it was in the place of Babylon where God was doing what he does, purging his remnant. So you might wonder why Currently is the divide so blatant, and I would say with spiritual insight, it's because God is purging his remnants. Seventy years is what Daniel is praying about, and the messenger comes. And this is going to be very complicated. We're going to spend a lot more time next week looking at it. The messenger comes and gives Daniel another set of 70s. Okay, before we get to that, how do I know that? 
Well, you got to understand this. If you're a Bible student, you must understand this book right here. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. Okay? I have tons of commentary sets. I spend most of my week reading every single one of them. But the Bible itself often gives us the color commentary that we need to unlock passages that are complicated. So I look to God's word to discern and decipher very challenging passages. Now let me read where we're headed. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. All right, what the heck was that? Let's look back at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined. Okay, get out of your mind the meaning, as we know it, of weeks. When I said weeks, you thought of what? Seven what? Days. But you got to understand, this is a Hebrew writer with Hebrew context. So if the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, a good Bible student goes, what does that word weeks mean? It's Shabua in Hebrew. Where is the first mention of Shabua in the Bible? It takes me to Genesis chapter 29, verse 18. And it's the story of Jacob telling Laban he would work to, to marry his daughter for seven, how many? Years. And I read it, it says, now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Verse 28, then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. How many years did he say it would work for her? Seven years. Later on, it tells us that is called a week. It's our dozen. When I say to you, I have three dozen donuts, I have how many donuts? 36. Good, math majors, 12, 24, 36. Dozen means 12. Decade means what? 10. Week here is the word heptad, shabua, or heptad in English. You know what it means? It means seven. So if we were to replace it, I want you to get this, 70 sevens. That's what it means. 70 sets of seven are determined. 70 sets of seven. Let's replace the word set with multiply. 70 multiply by seven. How many is that? 490. 490 what? Years. Not days. 490 years are determined. 490 years are set as an itinerary for Israel. This is what the angel is saying. Don't get confused. 490 years are established. This is what God is going to do. Daniel, I want you to write this vision and prophecy down. There are 490 years that are determined for the history of your people. It's very, it's very simple. So I put together, again, a blueprint for us to see where we're going next week. This is exactly the key that unlocks this calendar. So in verse 25, we read about seven weeks of years, or seven sets of seven. Seven sets of seven is 49 years. So 49 years is going to happen, but there's going to be triggers. Something's going to happen that's going to establish a 49-year period. And then he goes, there's 62 weeks of years, or 62 sets of seven. That's 434 years. Daniel, something's going to happen with your people that is going to determine a period that has 483 years, 49 plus 434 Okay, and guess what happens? Everything that the prophecy said would happen has happened. You know what's left based on this prophecy? If there's 70 weeks, 70 sets of seven, guess how many were fulfilled? 69. How many are left, math students? 70 minus 69? One. One set of sevens is left. Now, I don't know where we're at on that church age line. I have no idea. But if all that was fulfilled and all that's left 
is Daniel 9.27 with the one week or the seven years, which is established by, the text says, the prince to come. Who's the prince to come? It's the Antichrist. And he's going to establish a peace deal with who? Daniel's people, Israel. And in, and, and in the middle of the week, which is how many years? Three and a half years in, he's going to do what? He's going to stop the sacrificial system. What sacrificial system? Well, the one that's going to take place because they're currently trying to rebuild a third temple. They're currently, presently, trying to rebuild a third temple, which means everything that is in this book is actually unfolding and transpiring. And I'm saying, I don't know how late we are in the day, but if we're in the middle of the church age and all I'm going to do is stand fast on the truth, preach, teach, live the gospel, I'm expecting that our God is going to call us out of the way. That's how close we are. And I don't know where you are with our Lord. If you don't have a relationship with him, you do not want to be on planet earth when all hell breaks loose, literally. We're going to talk in such detail next week about verses 24 to 27. I would encourage you, look at me. It's the first time I said that all night. Read verses 24 to 27. Read them slow. Read them knowing the gospel. And as you read a term that sounds familiar, like the Messiah or the prince would be cut off, go, wait, that sounds like somebody getting killed. Jesus got killed. And go, yeah, that's, that's what happened. Read it knowing the history. And then read it knowing that it's going to be fulfilled prophecy. Okay, one more final thought. Who's this prophecy for? Seventy weeks are determined for who? Daniel's people. Daniel's people. Who are, who are Daniel's people? The Jews. This is Israel's itinerary. There's no mention in Old Testament prophecy about the church. There's no mention of the church in the seven-year tribulation. The only mentioning of the church in Revelation are the letters written to the seven churches. So if there's a timeline for the nation of Israel, then we can rest assured there's a timeline for the church. And if there's a timeline for the church's existence you can rest assured there's a timeline for your existence. If our God is that precise and that accurate from the day he knew you would be born to the day he knows he's calling you home and there's bookends that we call a birth date and a death date and I'm wondering how are you living your life in between? Because if this is true, the time that is appointed to us by God must be time that is designed to point us to God. If you're being honest, your life BC, BC means before Christ. Isn't it fascinating when Jesus was born, time literally was altered. Our calendar, as we know it, was completely altered. On the history timeline, time's going down, right? BC, it's counting down. And I'm going, that's so fascinating because that's exactly my life before Christ. My time was counting down, down, down to hell. And then Christ entered in, interrupted, intercepted, and my life has now entered A.D., which is Anno Domini. It means the year of our Lord. And because I claim him as my Lord, my time is under his authority. So now my time is going up, up to heaven. And I want to live in light of that, but I don't want to forget that every single part of my life, every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every year, God was using to get my attention because he was pursuing me. He loves me. And when he finally got a hold of my heart, he cleaned it up. He put himself inside of my temple. And then he fills me up with his Holy Spirit to live out my Christian walk for such a time as this. But there's another timeline, church. And it's another BC and another AD. And this BC is before coronavirus. Because that is a line of demarcation where everyone in the world may not have been exposed to the virus, everyone in the world was exposed by the virus. Where your loyalties and allegiances lied, where your faith was when you had no control over something. So fascinating and sad. Those that I think in my mind who were with us, BC, 
people you would think had great faith because that's what they talked about them having. They knew God so well. And now they're missing. Bunkered in their homes. Afraid. And now they're saying there's a new variant. And I'm saying to anybody that claims Christ, that if you fear the Delta, stop claiming to have faith in the Alpha and the Omega. It's time to enter into AD. It's time to enter into the acknowledgement of the deception. And recognize exactly where you're at on God's itinerary. Now is not the time to be silent. See, absolutely nothing in this world can take your life until God permits. Nothing in this world can preserve your life unless God permits, which leaves nothing left for me to do but to rest and trust that what God permits is always good and gracious and necessary. And if he is completely in control, what's left for me to do but to praise him for being the defender that he is? I know who I am in Christ. And if you don't know me, my name's Matthew Mayer, and I'd rather stand alone with Jesus Christ than sit in a large crowd without him. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it tonight. By God's grace, let's do it. God bless.